Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, as Canada struggles to cope with Omicron, a plane load of partying Sunwing passengers sparks strong words from the Prime Minister. Their challenge getting home. More rapid tests are headed your way, but a note of caution. Plus, amid exploding cases, is wastewater the best way to track Omicron? And green, rainy Vancouver is looking a bit out of character these days. What's behind the wild winter weather? This is The National. Tonight in hospitals across the country, the number of COVID patients is at record levels. Daily new infections off the charts. And sick calls are slowing down services and business across the country as we search for a way to withstand the Omicron wave. But while hundreds of thousands of Canadians are lining up for vaccines, including young children, the Prime Minister acknowledged public frustration with the holdouts. When people see that we're in uh, lockdowns or serious public health restrictions right now because um, the risk posed to all of us by unvaccinated people, people get angry. And that frustration isn't just reserved for vaccine holdouts. Today, the Prime Minister added his voice to the growing chorus of anger over the reckless behaviour on board a Sunwing charter flight. Passengers flagrantly breaking COVID protocols, putting safety at risk for the sake of a good time. Alison Northcott has the latest tonight. Partiers drinking, dancing and vaping, captured in videos from a pre-New Year's charter flight to Mexico. The images posted on social media have prompted attention and outrage after a report in the Journal de Montréal and today blowback from the Prime Minister. And it's a slap in the face to see people putting themselves, putting their fellow citizens, putting uh, airline workers at risk by being completely irresponsible. Transport Canada is now investigating. It was a Sunwing flight that took the partiers, including Quebec influencers and reality TV cast members, to Cancun, but the airline has since cancelled their flight home, saying the passengers' behaviour was unruly and contravened several Canadian aviation regulations as well as public health regulations. The airline said it provided conditions for the return flight, but that the group didn't accept all of the terms. The travellers could now have a hard time getting back home because other airlines are also refusing to fly them. But some say they did not misbehave. The people in this video say they were on the flight, but that they were not among the rowdy ones. We were part of a group, she says, but we never could have known the flight would degenerate the way it did. Rules are made for everybody. This pilot and researcher wonders why the pilot didn't stop the flight. To remove those passengers and to be able to continue with those one who are respecting the rules and want to do it. And if not, just end the flight over there. And today, the organizer tweeted he's taking this seriously. I will take a moment to sit down and rethink everything, especially how I can do things better next time. The federal transport minister says the passengers could face fines of up to $5,000 for each offence. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. There are more than 5,000 patients in hospitals across the country with COVID, and that's a level that we haven't seen before in this pandemic. Until about three weeks ago, Canada's COVID hospitalizations were still slowly declining. And then, up to 10 days ago, the increase seemed modest. What's happened since then is a big jump in new patients so far driven mostly by Ontario and Quebec. Other provinces now bracing for a similar surge. Along with the rapid spread has come a quick rise in demand for rapid tests. The government has purchased more than 100 million, but as Olivia Stefanovic explains, getting the tests is only the first challenge. Despite widespread demand, it's nearly impossible to find a rapid test in some parts of the country. don't even know really where to get them or where they're available. 
It's definitely discouraging, especially uh, at this point where we're two years into the pandemic. So. Sydney Pagan spent weeks trying to get her hands on one in Ontario. She still hasn't found any. It would be great to be able to have more access just to ensure that we are being safe. Let's be honest, this isn't how anyone wanted to be starting uh, 2022. The federal government is trying to meet the need, promising to quadruple the number of rapid tests sent to the provinces and territories last month and deliver 140 million this month. We have the tools we need to get through this new wave of the pandemic. Let's continue to exercise caution. Before Christmas, it was like the Hunger Games trying to get a rapid test. The opposition says the announcement should have come a long time ago. We have so many incredible tools that we could be using to find the right balance to manage COVID if there was federal leadership. As provinces and territories work on distribution, there are still questions about how to best use the test. If you tested negative in the morning, that doesn't mean that you may not test negative uh, you know, later on. Medical experts say the jury is still out on how effective rapid tests are at detecting Omicron. It's not quite clear if, if you know, you're truly negative. And there sometimes, of course, can be false negative tests. An imperfect tool they say is still useful. If you have a positive rapid test, you're positive, like full stop. The government hopes these shipments will help ease the burden on the overwhelmed public testing system by helping Canadians manage this latest wave at home. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. And joining us now is Dr. Danielle Martin, a family physician and chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. And as we can see, you are busy working this evening. But, but let's talk about rapid tests. You know, a lot of people want to get as many rapid tests as they can. From your perspective, how useful are they? They're useful, but they need to be used in the right way. So I think we're going to see um, in this Omicron wave uh, a lot more use of more frequent rapid testing for people who have no symptoms in particular kinds of work environments and perhaps even in schools as a way to try to pick up people who have infection but no symptoms or very few symptoms. And then the other way that we're going to see the use of rapid tests is if you have a symptom of COVID-19 and you take a rapid test at home and you test positive, you should assume that you have the virus. In other words, we won't need uh, to be doing as much confirmatory PCR testing. So symptoms plus a positive rapid test means then you have to isolate um, and behave as though you have COVID-19 and do all of the things that we know you should do in that circumstance. So here's the thing. What if you have some symptoms, you're not sure if you have COVID or not, and you take that rapid test and it is negative? And in that case, then you can't completely rely on those results. What we do see is... Uh, sometimes people will test negative. They may test negative for even a few days, and then eventually that test will turn positive. They may test negative on a rapid test and then later test positive on a PCR test. So that is the circumstance where we would say you can't fully rely on that, uh, on that negative result. If you have symptoms, then you need to uh, behave as though you've got the virus. At this point, there is so much spread of, uh, of Omicron variant that we have to behave as though we have that infectious COVID-19 uh, virus, even if that test comes back negative. Dr. Martin, always nice talking to you. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. The sheer number of infections is leading to a storm of sick calls and staff quarantines. Thomas Dagla shows us how it's disrupting businesses and services, including essential ones. At Vince's Market and grocery stores across the country, the trouble isn't getting stock to fill the shelves, it's having enough staff to keep the places running. We've had to close departments early. We have not yet had the case where we've had to close an entire store or department. However, uh, we were close uh, last week and we're getting close again. From commuter trains in Toronto to public skating in Calgary, services are being scaled back virtually everywhere as more and more workers call in sick. These changes are likely to continue for the coming weeks. Edmonton's fire department is dealing with dozens of confirmed infections. Right now, 
we're looking at what work is priority work. While Winnipeg police are now under a state of emergency, cutting back on some duties so available officers can be redeployed to the front lines. Some of the more community orientated uh, problems and some of our gang enforcement uh, would, would take a back seat. Ontario and BC's top doctors expect Omicron could leave 30% of the workforce sick or exposed. To ease the burden, most provinces have cut down isolation time to as little as five days. Nova Scotia won't go below seven. We know that having close contacts isolate is creating huge impacts on, the, on our workforce. Widespread absenteeism is set to last well into February, with COVID still spreading rapidly compounding Canada's long-standing labour shortages. What well, we're kind of worried about currently is that if, if this wave has indeed exacerbated, um, you know, the, the, the challenges. From grocery stores to government services, staff will be squeezed for weeks. With everyone's routine already upended, there's more disruption ahead. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. As Ontario battles a surge in COVID-related hospitalizations, the province is once again going into a partial shutdown. I guess it makes sense, honestly, if they're going to try to, you know, contain everything and um, try to make sure that the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. More than 2,000 people now in hospital with COVID in Ontario, up from nearly 1,300 yesterday. Theatres and gyms have closed, as well as indoor dining, and social gatherings have been limited as part of a host of new restrictions. Students are also affected with millions going back to online learning as of today. Ontario is just one of the provinces putting off a return to the classroom, giving schools an opportunity to put in more protections for staff and students. As Deanna Sumanag johnson shows us, there are lots of suggestions about what should be done. It's a thought on the minds of so many parents in Ontario today, with their kids again learning virtually. It's just not possible. They get through the day. It would be nice if we can do the things that need to be done to open schools up properly. High school science teacher Jason Bradshaw shares that hope and there's something he'd like Ontario to do to make that happen. I would like to see education workers and students who are eligible be prioritized for getting boosters. I know as of right now, um, a lot of education workers have not been able to schedule their booster appointments anytime before uh, January 17th. Ontario has committed to delivering 3,000 additional HEPA filters to improve ventilation in schools. It is also promising N95 masks for school staff. These are the masks. Something Dr. Anna Wallach would also like to see given to every student and every teacher in BC. So in BC, in September 2020, all the schools handed out cloth masks. I don't see why we cannot do the same for N95 masks. Some experts would like to see rapid tests handed out the same way, part of Quebec's strategy announced today. We will begin the distribution to our students in elementary schools and in preschool for more than 3.6 million self-tests. It's a test-to-stay strategy, uh, meaning that if a child was exposed to COVID, they could safely continue in-person learning if they regularly test negative. And even with all these measures, Omicron's risk in schools will only be made smaller, not eliminated. Some kids might be at risk for more severe infections or they might be going back to a home where someone's at risk for a more severe outcome. So you have to have that flexibility to allow for uh, certain individuals to have online learning uh, as well. As families and educators look at the best quick measures to get yet another school year derailed by the pandemic back on track. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. In the U.S., the Centers for Disease Control is not requiring a negative test for those leaving their COVID isolation period. However, the agency says that if one is used, it doesn't mean that things can go back to normal. If that test is negative, people really do need to understand that they must continue to wear their mask um, for those uh, extra five days after um, the com to complete a 10-day isolation period. You may remember the CDC facing criticism after it reduced its recommended isolation period from 10 days to five last week, saying transmission generally happens early in the course of the illness. 
The top-ranked men's tennis star Novak Djokovic is being deported from Australia. He was there for one of the sport's major tournaments, the Australia Open. But as Jamie Strachan tells us, questions about his vaccination status have led to his expulsion. That's it. Novak Djokovic still unconquered. Australia has always been a special place for Novak Djokovic. He's won a remarkable nine Australian titles. He may not get a chance to win a tenth this year. Rules are rules. And there are no special cases. The number one men's tennis player in the world, who is apparently unvaccinated, had been granted a medical exemption to enter Australia. But after being held at the Melbourne airport overnight, officials have cancelled his visa and ordered Djokovic to leave the country after the Serbian star failed to provide appropriate evidence to support his exemption. Clearly that did not pass uh, the standards of proof that were required by the Australian border force. Anger has been brewing over Djokovic's exemption in a country that has been one of the most heavily locked down in the world. We've all gone out and got our our jabs and our boosters and um, we have someone that's come from overseas and all of a sudden he's he's been exempt and can play and I think it's an absolute disgrace. Officials scrambled to assure that Djokovic received no special treatment, that his name wasn't attached to the request for an exemption. No one will be receiving special treatment because of who they are or what they have achieved professionally. Compounding matters was Djokovic's refusal to discuss why he received the exemption, something Australian tennis officials implored him to do. We have been through a very tough period of the past two years and, and we would appreciate you know, some answers to that. All of this is a giant headache for tournament organisers who thought the world's top player would be on the court. By the numbers, he, he probably is the greatest player of all time. It's hard to, to deny that. And obviously, for that reason, the Australian Open would love to have him there. Tonight, Djokovic is believed to be quarantining at this local hotel. His lawyers are expected to appeal. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Violent protests in the Central Asian nation of Kazakhstan have now turned deadly. Clashes between protesters and police have left at least eight security personnel dead and hundreds more injured. No figures on civilian casualties have been released. The protest, first sparked by rising fuel prices, have quickly grown into anti-government demonstrations. A Russia-led military alliance says it will be dispatching peacekeeping forces in the country. Saturday marks two years since that Ukrainian airliner was shot down by Iran. Many of the 176 people on board had ties to this country. As Ashley Burke explains, their families have grown frustrated with Canada's response and say they have lost faith in the RCMP's role in the investigation. Broken credit cards. This is all Hamida Smilian has of his wife and nine-year-old daughter's belongings retrieved from the debris of Flight PS752. Rita's wife card. He spent the past two years searching for answers and countless hours sharing his testimony, evidence and messages with RCMP, including tips from people who said they were insiders in Iran. I was in military service right near the scene. But he says the RCMP didn't speak to informants outside Canada, so he traveled to Ukraine himself, where he says officials told him the RCMP still hadn't shared his testimony with Ukrainian investigators. I have had several, as I said, several meetings with RCMP and all of them were recorded. So they should have been uh, passed to Ukraine, but they were not. The RCMP's commissioner, Brenda Lucky, conceded to families the pace is slow. In a letter obtained by CBC News, she wrote all information has to be analyzed and assessed for risk before it can be shared with Ukraine's criminal investigation. The international aspect of this, uh, this particular case uh, makes this a very complicated case uh, for the RCMP to manage, which ostensibly could take uh, uh, quite a few years. Complicating the case further, some of the victims' families have reported threats and harassment coming from Iran. CSIS says it may constitute foreign interference. You need to potentially juxtapose the evidence collected with uh, potential national security uh, investigations. Victims' families have long called for Ukrainian investigators to come here to Canada to speak to them directly. The RCMP's commissioner this summer promised to help make that happen. But Ukraine's prosecutor general's office says the pandemic got in the way and now it's waiting to hear from Canada. 
Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. We're learning more about the shadowy world behind a far-right extremist group and how authorities failed to act on information they had about it. Obviously, it sets off alarm bells. It would certainly cause an additional investigation in the United States. Up next, the Fifth Estate investigation and the secret audio tapes revealing a violent ideology. Plus, a year after the storming of the U.S. Capitol, a country still bitterly divided. It's not just a stain. It's not just an embarrassment. And we absolutely should not just move on. Coming up, the struggle for justice and the fear it could happen again. And a little later. An Ontario man's quest to raise your spirits one lonely yodel at a time. We're back in two. This is, uh, without a doubt, one of the most tragic days in our city's history. Um, loss of so many people in such a tragic way. At least seven children were among the 13 people killed after a fire tore through a duplex in Philadelphia this morning. No cause has been determined, but officials say the four smoke alarms in the building don't appear to have been working. The base is angry, violent, and steeped in the ideology of white supremacy. With access to secret audio tapes, the fifth estate is exposing that hate. And as the base recruited in Canada, Jillian Finley looks at how authorities here fail to act on information they have. Like, those guys were on a trajectory that was going to be violent. And it was. There was no question about it. I could hear them tick. He goes by the name Tradian, an anti-fascist activist who for nearly a year and a half infiltrated the base, eventually leaving with thousands of screen grabs, video and audio recordings, of more than a hundred would-be recruits. Last October, base member and former Winnipeg military reservist Patrick Matthews was sentenced to nine years in a U.S. prison after the FBI tracked him to training camps in Georgia and secretly recorded him and other base members plotting an attack in Virginia. If you want the white race to survive, you're going to have to do your f***ing part, derail some f***ing trains, kill some people, and poison some water supplies. Matthew's membership in the violent neo-Nazi group was first exposed by the Winnipeg Free Press. After police detained the reservists briefly, he fled to the States. RCMP told the public it found weapons in his home, but it never revealed it also found this, a handwritten list of mass killings, locations and dates, dead and wounded, details of the shooters responsible. Well, obviously it sets off alarm bells. It would certainly cause an additional investigation in the United States. It should have caused additional investigation. It would cause an additional investigation in the United States. But there was no additional investigation in Canada, admits the RCMP, even though it and this country's military now acknowledge they were warned about Matthews' extremist links months before. No comment, ma People like Matthews, perfect for this gig. Specifically his knowledge of explosives. That was considered valuable. In his interview, a Fifth Estate exclusive, Tradian says the base prioritized military experience. And Matthews wasn't the only Canadian talking to them. The group has since been outlawed in Canada as a terrorist entity. But the hate that drove it is still very much alive and growing. Julian Finley, CBC News, Toronto. And you can see the Fifth Estate's full investigation into the base Thursday night, 9 p.m. on CBC Television and CBC Gem, 9.30 in Newfoundland. On the eve of the anniversary of the storming of the Capitol, the United States remains a country politically fractured. This movement is not fading away. Up next, what it could mean for the state of U.S. democracy. Plus... An unusual dose of winter weather on the West Coast. What's behind it? That's coming up. The Justice Department remains committed to holding all January 6 perpetrators at any level accountable under law. We will follow the facts wherever they lead. The U.S. Attorney General promising justice ahead of the one-year anniversary of the January 6th attack when hundreds of Trump supporters forced their way into the Capitol building 
attempting to prevent the confirmation of U.S. President Joe Biden. All of this seen live on television, shocking the world and raising questions about the stability of the United States. The sweeping congressional investigation into what really happened that day and who is responsible continues to inch forward. But support for it remains almost completely divided along party lines. Susan Ormison examines what all this means for a deeply fractured America where anger may be at an all-time high and trust is dangerously low. January 6th is seared in America's conscience. The ongoing criminal investigation, one of the largest in U.S. history. It's not just a stain, it's not just an embarrassment, and we absolutely should not just move on. In the last year, more than 700 Americans have been arrested from nearly every state. More than 30 have been sentenced to prison so far, with more on the way. Like Jennifer Ryan, who took a private plane from Texas to Washington a year ago and said storming the Capitol was the best day of her life. Hello everyone, it's me, Jenna. Then boasted she'd never go to jail because she's white, blonde and has a great job. She was wrong. Her 30 days in jail starts this week. And the only thing that I can see that's good about having to go to prison is that I'm going to be able to work out a lot. Then there's Paul Hodgkins, a Florida crane operator who got eight months in jail after pleading guilty to obstruction. Robert Palmer got five years the longest to date for resisting and assaulting officers. And who could forget Jacob Chansley, the so-called QAnon shaman, beginning 41 months in prison even while admitting he messed up royally. Many Americans would like to think January 6th was a one-off, a horrible, violent day that wouldn't happen again. But Chuck Rosenberg, a former senior FBI official, says the threat is still there. There are some who think that what happened on January 6th, and I'm one of them, was appalling, repulsive. And there are some who think that what happened on January 6th um, was insufficient and will continue, I believe, uh, to uh, articulate that Joe Biden is an invalid president and that Donald Trump should be returned. A new poll taken in late December suggests 62% of Americans now expect violence over the outcome of future presidential elections. Another poll that 34% of Americans believe violence against the government is justified. One year on, there's a mound of data on who stormed the Capitol. A research team at the University of Chicago built a profile of those arrested, mostly white, male, and urban. I thought, like many, that they were coming from the fringe. Dr. Robert Pape found that while some were members of right-wing extremist groups, most were not. Over half are business owners, CEOs, or from white-collar occupations, doctors, lawyers, and architects. Uh, only 7% were unemployed at the time they broke into the Capitol. Well, this is completely different than the economic profile of right-wing extremists. And the motivations that led them to rioting, he says, still circulate. You might think that arresting hundreds and hundreds of people who are going to serve jail time for breaking into the Capitol would have a chilling effect. This movement is not fading away. Inside the Capitol, a second intense investigation, a special January 6th committee digging into who conspired and plotted January 6th and what the former president and the White House knew about it. I remember very clearly the sound of boom, 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 like a battering ram as people tried to barrel their way into the House of Representatives and uh, members tried to go over to reinforce the wall. Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin was inside the Capitol that day. His new book, Unthinkable, details the insurrection and tragically his own son's suicide just the week before. And that I really felt no fear for myself because I just kept feeling that we had already lost what was most precious to us in our son, Tommy. The worst thing that ever could happen had already happened. And I was not afraid of these 
fascist insurrectionists who are trying to tear down our government. I was very angry about it. Do we have lords and nobles and friends of presidents who don't have to respond to congressional subpoenas or court subpoenas if they don't want to? Raskin is a key member of the January 6th special committee, which has subpoenaed senior people in Donald Trump's circle. This is how we move on. We move on by telling the truth about the systematic, coordinated attack on American democracy. We're going to tell a riveting, compelling story to the American people about how this attack took place, who paid for it, who organized it, who coordinated it, and what are the changes we need to make in order to defend ourselves in the future. By nightfall last January 6th, the Capitol was once again under control, but Americans were reeling. Calm has returned here, but still underneath divisive currents magnified one year ago. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. And joining us now is Tom Nichols, contributing writer at The Atlantic and the author of Our Own Worst Enemy, and he joins us from Middletown, Rhode Island. Tom, I know you've been keeping a close eye on, on what's happening on Capitol Hill. What do you hope will, will come out of the, the, the investigation into January 6th? I want what I think most Americans want, which is accountability. I think we know what happened, uh, but I don't think we know everything about um, who was involved, particularly involving members of Congress and the former president. And uh, I actually would hope that these hearings would be televised in prime time and that we would finally um, air this out. I, I worry that too many of my fellow citizens here in the United States uh, aren't taking this seriously enough. I think some, some of us want to just move past it, but I think there has to be accountability. There has to be a price paid, and not just for the people who showed up that day who are doing various lengths of jail sentences. It has to be for the people who organized and inspired and, and arranged this. Your Twitter bio describes you as a democracy enthusiast, but describe to us now the state of democracy in the United States. I began my career studying the old Soviet Union, and I never thought that I would have to be part of a pro-democracy movement in the United States. But I think that is where we are. One of our major parties um, has become an authoritarian movement. And so I think the state of democracy in the United States is that it's still healthy. Um, God bless federalism, where the 50 states are um, holding their own uh, in terms of functioning democracies, but I don't know how long that can last if the federal government and an entire political party um, totally abandons the notion of uh, liberal representative democracy. So I think we're okay for now, but the next year is going to tell the tale. So, so the Republicans supporting an authoritarian state, for someone who's, who's listening casually to this conversation and wondering, this guy from the U.S., is he prone to hyperbole? Is that an exaggeration? I, actually, um, I have often been accused by some of my readers uh, for being too sanguine. I should also say that I'm a former Republican. I was a Republican for 30-something years. Um, but... Uh, I think like a lot of former Republicans and like a lot of Americans in general, uh, there I, I see a real problem here. I see a collapse of public and civic commitment to the norms and processes of liberal democracy. Um, I particularly see a party, my former party, um, that says if we lose elections, they are by definition unfair. And when enough people believe that they have a right to win elections, whether they won them or not, um, you're on the road to authoritarianism. And yes, it can happen here. We have about a minute left. Let's talk about the other party now, the Democrats, and, and about voting rights, bringing in new people or new to the voting process to actually cast a ballot. Are the Democrats doing enough? One of my great fears about the current state of American democracy is that the only party that can form a coalition of people from the left to the right and hold back this movement, this authoritarian movement, is the Democratic Party. And I'm just not sure they're up, up for the fight. I'm not sure they have the stomach for it. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the fact that so many Democrats, even now, uh, don't show up to vote. And, you know, as a former Republican, I can tell you one thing that one of the secret weapons Republicans have always had is that they always show up to vote. Um, I think if Democrats and particularly young people show up to vote, we'll be talking about this a year from now as something in the past. But again, this coming year is going to tell the tale 
Uh, and I, I hope the Democrats really have the, the strength for what's coming. So much to think about. I hope we get a chance to talk about this again. Thank you. Thank you. For those of us living here in Vancouver, it has been an unusual winter. Getting 10 to 20 centimeter snow is quite significant given that the Vancouver average for January is about, uh, about 12 centimeters of snow. Coming up, what's behind this cold blast? Plus, we'll tell you that, you know, maybe we have 30,000 cases in Ontario rather than 13,000. Coming up with testing for Omicron overwhelmed, why some scientists think what's in our sewers could give us a better read on the pandemic. People in Vancouver trying to make the most out of this cold snap that has been gripping much of British Columbia for days now. And it looks like it's not over yet. More snow falling across BC's south coast tonight with officials warning people to be prepared for disruptions. Susanna De Silva walks us through it all. While the grill is helping to keep Owen Chan warm, a few other things on his food truck are feeling the cold. My olive oil is a little freezing, but <laughs> that's not much. And I have to be careful with the water pipes. And it is usually a scramble to take advantage of brief snow days in Metro Vancouver. Instead, the ground has been white in some places since before Christmas. With temperatures averaging 10 degrees below normal and unfortunately timed snowfalls with another big one on the way. Getting 10 to 20 centimeters snow is quite significant given that the Vancouver average for January is about, uh, about 12 centimeters of snow. The Fraser Valley could see 30 followed by freezing rain. Prolonged conditions that are a challenge to those without a home with some shelters seeing signs of frostbite. When it is a day or two days or three days of cold and snow or sleet, um, it's more manageable. We're looking at potentially extreme and fatal consequences for our community members who are experiencing homelessness. While northern BC is also dealing with wind chills of minus 40, extreme cold that is spread across the country with warnings in place throughout much of Alberta. You've had 29 days in a row with below freezing temperatures. The same goes for Saskatchewan, throughout Manitoba, and into northern Ontario, complicating a difficult situation for one remote First Nation dealing with a major outbreak of COVID. There's no one there to cut the wood because it's, it, it's COVID, and the essential workers that usually do this for the First Nation are sick themselves. There will be some relief, at least in Western Canada, with BC temperatures returning to seasonal next week and places in Alberta could see a 40 degree jump to just above freezing. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, for more on the situation here in British Columbia, let's bring in our meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff. And, and Joe, take us through this kind of weather. We get it once in a while, mm -hmm. but, but certainly not every year. Not every year. You're right, Ian. It takes a unique setup like the one we're getting tonight, uh, basically a mini atmospheric river, a warm Pacific system colliding with this Arctic air in place across the province. That for us is the recipe for accumulating snow, changing over to rain with a freezing rain risk. But it has been quite the winter. Metro Vancouver already has 40 to 60 centimeters of snow this winter. So this is on top of that, getting almost 30 centimeters by tomorrow morning. And as you said, Ian, uh, these events are becoming more unusual with our warming climate, but this still looking to be one of our top 10 snowiest winters of all time. Uh, you know, challenging for people for sure, but also beautiful. Look at that background behind you uh, and more snow coming. What is in store for British Columbia? Yes, you're right. If you can uh, stay off the roads and enjoy it, it is spectacular, but uh, travel is going to be tricky because of that changeover. I want to show you the snowfall accumulations expected across the south coast more snow than we've seen in any of the previous events this winter. We're talking 10 to 30 centimeters for Metro Vancouver with higher amounts to the north and over towards the island. But it's really that changeover to rain sometime tomorrow as the warm air winds out over the Arctic air that will lead to freezing rain accumulating for much of the south coast. So ice on top of the snow, that's going to be a big problem before things warm up in the long range. And it is going to be rain eventually uh, tomorrow, raining all through Friday. And Ian, the big warm-up will come 
Sunday into next week. And I know that's a warm up that most of Western Canada is looking for as well. Finally, out of the deep freeze after weeks of these kinds of temperatures. All right, Johanna, thank you so much. You're welcome. With testing capacity swamped by the Omicron wave, some scientists say testing wastewater may be the answer. Coming up, the push to measure case counts in our sewers. I'm Jamie Poisson, tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. The stories of some of the dozens of Canadians who have died in police custody after being picked up for the petty offence of public intoxication. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. As COVID testing has become overwhelmed across the country, some experts are turning to other ways to determine how much of the virus is in our communities. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, it involves slogging for clues in the most unpleasant of places. It's not pretty, but it could be helpful. For more than a year, Dalhousie University researchers have been testing wastewater for COVID at Halifax's main plants, but also at localized sites, such as on campus, by dropping this ball down the sewer. Water will, in the sewer, will continually go by this, this filter paper, and then after 24 hours, we pull the device out and extract the whatever's been accumulated on this filter paper. Yes, that means they're studying what you flush. And some researchers say the surge in Omicron cases makes it more important than ever. We're starting to see um, challenges to management by things like limited PCR testing and clinical testing. Then the potential for its use is is much more um, obvious. But the testing is not standardized and how provinces are using it is all over the map. Ontario has a coordinated wastewater surveillance network that covers 75% of the province's population. It's not going to give you accuracy to the number, but it will tell you that, you know, maybe we have 30,000 cases in Ontario rather than 13,000. He says right now, wastewater testing could actually provide a better picture of how much COVID is in our communities. But Nova Scotia's Chief Medical Officer of Health disagrees. Uh, we continue to have conversations with the researchers, but there's a lot of questions. And in, 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 from a public health perspective, we don't feel that it's yet at a point where we can accurately use it as a surveillance tool. Conan says analyzing wastewater has been done before, mostly in Europe, to look for polio. She says it should be used to augment other practices, not replace them. Back at Dalhousie, Gagnon agrees. You might see it as a, you know, a, a smoke over the hills. One more tool at a time when clinical testing is just overwhelmed. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Coming up, an Ontario man's yodeling that's echoing around the world. Find out why he's doing that in our moment next. This Ontario man calls himself the lonesome yodeler. Feeling isolated from the pandemic, Christian Howald took to the streets of Sudbury. Along the way, he started recording himself and posting the videos on YouTube to bring some joy to people around the world. And that is our moment. My mother always yodeled and sang. She had a beautiful voice, but I was always embarrassed in my voice, so I didn't try it. It's when I had children, I started learning all the childhood songs, and I thought, let's try to learn songs in different languages. So then I got to singing opera and yodeling, and then I started having lots of fun. What got really hard is two years ago, with everything being locked up, I started having to work out of my attic, and it just got really isolated. And this summer, my wife had posted some videos and it started getting hits. And I thought, let's try to share this positivity. I got a lot of really good comments from one of them. This lady said, you know what? This morning it started really sad. And hearing your Yodel just made me so happy. Somebody from Iceland says, we have a cave in Iceland where you would sound amazing. Breathe deep, sing loud, and be happy. 
so the task for our producer Alvin was to make us better understand and appreciate the little known art of yodeling, which I think he uh, managed to do. And if you're looking for a little piece of trivia about Sudbury, apparently there's a group of 40 Swiss expats, including Christian, who meet there in August. One of the things they do is learn to yodel. That is The National for January the 5th. Good night.